Hello and welcome to episode three of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden. Um, we're going to explain to you what Word Search is about again and for your benefit, help you to see where we've been on Word Search in our previous episodes before exploring in more detail our current focus of Word Search, which is exploring Acts chapter three and four about the mission, the message, the ministers, and the members. On this occasion, we'll be exploring the content, context, and the concepts, as well as conclusions behind what we see in Acts chapter three in particular, where Peter begins his message. And after that, we'll be addressing some prayer points that have come out of our exploration. So word search, what is it all about? Word search is a place to search God's word, but it's also a time where we endeavor to allow God's word to search us. We're here to encourage godly character development as we stimulate each other to be seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And that is with the intent that our word search will inform and indeed transform our prayer and practice. Here at Word Search, we're here to find treasure in God's word so that we can be hearers and doers of the word. Previously on Word Search, we had established my conviction that every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ is a member of the family of God and the body of Christ, that they're a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a messenger of the good news of the King, and they're a missionary of the kingdom of God. And it's good to know what, you're, what you've let yourself in for when you've repented, believed, and been baptized, as well as received the Holy Spirit, so that like an athlete or a soldier, to stay fit, as a believer and a disciple, you can be in form. So you can see there's four M's in being a member, minister, messenger, and missionary. That was established as our overall insight as to how this particular part of our series is being uh, developed. And so focusing then on the context of Acts chapter 3 and 4, uh, we were looking at what had happened previously in Acts chapters 1 and 2 that had led to this particular situation. And I gave an over, overview of that situation, as well as an outline of where we're going in our time together. And where we've been so far is that we've already uh, considered the encounter that takes place in Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 11 and there we looked at some of the concepts uh, that were going on in that particular incident in the encounter including how the fact that Peter and John had been with Jesus made them alert to kingdom opportunities uh, and from that we also developed on those concepts to look at conclusions that we as believers can be looking at when it comes to us and the mission of God us and what God wants us to do and if we're sensitive to kingdom opportunities by associating with Jesus and being led by the same spirit that rose him from the dead. Now to discover more about that and other previous chapters I encourage you to uh, check out um, the other videos that are on this uh, channel or the other audio that's on the channel that you're listening to to find out more information that leads into what we're looking at today. For the time being then we're hoping to explore in more detail the message that Peter preaches, uh, particularly first in looking at chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. But what I want to do uh, initially is to read the entire message that we have recorded in Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 26. And that says as follows. So Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 26 says, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him 
but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God had raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who are spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. As ever, I pray that God will give us a great blessing just from hearing the word being read as we then discover further what's going on in it. I always believe that there is a blessing in just reading the word and hearing the word read and allowing it to make such a difference to our lives as we meditate on it. Now, as I mentioned, uh, it's my desire to focus initially on the first part of this speech by Peter. It does give us some good insights for us to consider carefully about the message that, in this case, Peter had for his particular audience. So when I was looking at this uh, particular section between verses 11 and 16 of Acts chapter 3, there were certain, per certain parts even uh, that jumped out at me that I thought were worth considering in terms of its content and what I loved initially was that in in the initial part when Peter saw it he addressed the people there was like Peter saw another kingdom opportunity just as Peter and John had seen a kingdom opportunity in demonstrating the kingdom of God so now Peter sees an opportunity to proclaim the good news so there's that opportunity of demonstrating and declaring and what that's all about. So there's that kind of pouncing on the opportunities where they arrive. Now, I understand what people mean when they say preach the gospel and use words if they're necessary and all that kind of stuff. I understand that because there is a demonstration that comes when we're looking at the kingdom of God. But that should never take away from the fact that we should be looking for opportunities to declare what the good news really is. So there's that element as well. And then there's also a small thing that you might overlook, but it's really important to remember that Peter knows his audience. So he's talking to, first of all, he's talking to people who are gathered in the temple. Uh, so they're there for religious reasons, which should mean that they understand to a degree their religious heritage. For example, this message wouldn't make sense if I was to go out to a, a local shopping center and or a big store and just stand out there and start talking about men of Israel as if A, people are from Israel and B, people have the religious heritage that they would understand what I'm talking about. So there's that idea of Peter having a connection with the audience that he's talking to. And that connection is important when we consider the historical link that Peter is making about why they are there in that temple at that time. He's talking to people who know where they're coming from and they know who they're serving because what Peter is announcing is very crucial 
uh, for them to understand that everything that they've been gathering there for for so many years is now being fulfilled. I'm also fascinated by the element of the fact that Peter refers to Jesus as the servant, as the servant of God. I love it because, as, as I'm outlining, I believe it's important that every believer recognizes that not only are they a member of the family of God, but they're also called to be a servant, that they're also called to be a minister of the Lord God. Now, minister, for some reason, has has connotations for some of, of, of somewhat being uh, a high position, that you're a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, or whatever it may be. But when we have that mentality that says that you're really a servant, there's always that thinking that says that we're not higher than anyone else, but we've actually come to do the will of whoever has sent us. And that's the big theme that Peter highlights here about Jesus has come to do the will of the one that sent him. And Peter, indeed, in declaring the gospel, is also carrying out the will of the one that has sent him as well. Now, the next part that I find interesting uh, to discover in the content of what we're reading is how Peter isn't, Peter isn't reluctant to uh, state clearly the responsibility that the people have had for the events that have taken place. You delivered over and denied. You denied the Holy and Righteous One. You killed the author of life. Um, that whole element of what you did, uh, almost accusatory, and it's, in a sense, it's supposed to get people aware of what they've done. So there's something very specific uh, there in terms of Peter being very clear in letting people know what they've done. But the reason why it's not an accusation is because for all of what they've done, they've really just fulfilled what God wanted to have done in the first place. As we'll discover in our next uh, session when we're looking at the second part of this message, there's an understanding and an allowance that a lot of what we do we, when we're in sin, we're, we're doing it in ignorance. A lot of what we do is being done in ignorance. That's not to say that we're not responsible for it, uh, but it is to say that uh, the bigger picture of what's going on, uh, thank God for what he has done despite what we've done. Thank God that in as much as in the same way that the people were being told by Peter, this is what you did to the author of life. God raised the author of life from the dead because not even death uh, could defeat him. And then there's that element of there's who you are, there's what, there's who God is, and then there's who we are. And, there, and that's interesting to consider when we're looking at the proclamation of the gospel. You are the messenger. Why are you the messenger? Why are you the one that has the message? And in Peter's case, he's in a position to share this message because he's witnessed the death, he's witnessed the resurrection, and he's witnessed the power of God in action, and that has already been revealed in that day of Pentecost where the promised Holy Spirit is given. And we too, it would be good if we had an idea of what part we play as messengers, if we can take on the responsibility that we have to share the message. Then there's the crucial element of this message at this point, which is about faith in Jesus, as Peter proclaims, by faith in his name, the faith that is through Jesus. Um, it's, it's really important that we're aware that our gospel demonstrations are based on the reality of the foundation of our gospel declaration, which is on Jesus, faith in Jesus, and what we get through the name of Jesus, as we depend on him completely for what we're hoping to do when it comes to kingdom demonstrations. So when it comes to kingdom demonstrations, we are only able to do what we do because of that contact, because of that faith that we have in him and what he does through us as a result. And I just love how Peter in this element of the message just emphasizes that what people can witness and what people cannot deny happens as a result of that faith in Jesus so to such a degree that he reinforces it by saying it twice this man is made whole because of Jesus you need to be sure you need to know that this man who you know who was crippled he's alive and he's well and he's bouncing and he's jumping and he's walking and he's leaping and he's praising God because of this same Jesus that you crucified but God rose 
from the dead. So it's intriguing to consider then what kind of concepts can we uh, see from this particular section of the message? Uh, first thing to reinforce is that there is an explanation for the demonstration. Um, the demonstration, they do say actions speak louder than words, true. And yet that doesn't stop there being words to explain the actions and to help people to get to an understanding of what's going on where it's concerned. And it's a platform for the message to be delivered. And here again, it's a crucial concept that we see in the section. The message is about the relationship between God and people. In that context, it was between God and the men of Israel, those people that had been a part of this great instance that happened to Jesus. But the gospel message as a whole is about the relationships between the creator God who made us in his image and us who are supposed to reflect that, but clearly uh, do not at this time. When Peter's talking about you did this, you did that, you did the other. There is a sense in which the message must convict. There's nothing about the message of Jesus Christ that should just leave us feeling comfortable and feeling a sense, oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's oh, that's nice. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, it's good to know that I'm loved. Oh, that's splendid. Oh, there's got to be an element of that message that should at least convict us of our condition and our position when we're not in Christ and what it leads us to do. But that conviction isn't for guilt. It's not just there to make us feel guilty. It's actually meant for God's glory. And there's also the uh, element about the message that it has to be rooted in faith in Jesus. It's got to be rooted in that. It's got to point people to how kingdom demonstrations are opportunities to declare what happens when we have faith in Jesus, it's got to, it cannot be downplayed or, or denied just how essential it is that our message must highlight and make a big deal of Jesus. And then there's an element of a concept that we can see that as well is if we're faithful as messengers, there's something about a message about a servant that's delivered by servants. So we are offering a service by sharing this message. Even as we're offering a service by demonstrating kingdom realities, there's this element that says that we're actually here to serve and we're actually to here to highlight somebody who served uh, so that you too can be a part of the service, if you will. Again, the whole aspect of understanding that we are servants, that we're ministers. So you can see the combination of, here is a man on a mission he completed that mission and gave a message, and that message highlighted the fact that the man on a mission was a minister who calls others to minister likewise, and how they minister is as much about them being messengers as it is about how they serve in other ways as well. Okay, so based on that, here are some conclusions that I want us to consider. God sends us on a mission with a message. Clearly, as we see with Peter, sure, he had been with Jesus, he's an apostle of Jesus, um, spent three and a half years with him, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we can think, well, it's just meant for them to carry on with that, but there's that same element that as the Father sent the Son, not only has the Son sent the apostles, but he's also sent all of those that put their trust in him to go out on a mission with a message of the good news of who the King is. Also, another key conclusion to bear in mind is we need to be sensitive about the audience that we're delivering the message to. It's all well and good having an audience that might have been well brought up on the Bible or have Christian values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as we understand, even in this day and age, even in countries like Britain or America, it's not a given that your audience will have that understanding of those concepts of a Christian heritage or what it is to be brought up on the values of scripture. And then when we consider other elements as well, like the multicultural nature of the uh, people that we're communicating to, there's got to be that level of understanding about the audience so that we can deliver the message in a faithful way that they can understand. It's also important to realize that the message is delivered by those who have received the message. It might sound obvious, uh, but sometimes you have to remember, what is that message that you received? Is that the right message? Uh, am I convinced about the message? 
And if I'm not convinced about the message, does that put me in a good place to be able to share that message with others? And that's not an excuse for you to sit around saying, well, I'm not convinced. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not sure X, Y, and Z. It's actually an opportunity for us to once more refresh ourselves with a message that should have already left us so filled with love and power and joy and a desire to see others come to know this Jesus that you just have to touch us and then we'll look for the opportunity to share that message with others. So that message is delivered by, by the recipients of it. And likewise, it's about understanding that it's the spirit of God that gives us the boldness to express the truth. Um, as I said, a number of times when you're hearing messages, they seem to be tailored not to offend or upset or to make people feel uncomfortable in any way. But it's the spirit of God that will give you the boldness to express the truth of the situation. And the truth of the situation is we're wrong. We are in the wrong. Uh, we have all sinned. We have all turned our back to God. And there's no one who can turn around and say, yeah, I'm righteous, actually. I'm doing all right. No, we're, we're all, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the standard that God has for us. And so that element should convict us, but not convict us for guilt, but convict us to then turn around and trust God for the right way. And not just the right way in terms of life, but us as ministers and us as messengers, we should be able to trust God to give us the ability to communicate the message in the right way and get the message across and getting the message across as we'll discover isn't necessarily always about getting the results that we're all looking for but at least it's giving us the understanding that we've been faithful to deliver the message to the people but there's more about the message that we're going to discover in our second part for the time being however um, here are some prayer points that i want us to consider in the light of what we studied at this time uh, first of all, I want us to pray that we will acknowledge God and the message he's given us to share. So it's really crucial that we can acknowledge God and that message. It's also crucial for us to give God thanks for this glorious gospel that he has entrusted to us. As we recognize and receive again what this good news is and what Jesus has done, and how God has made right relationships again and able to demonstrate his kingdom as we give thanks for that and absorb that and meditate on that as well. That should then propel us uh, to really go out and share that message. So point one, acknowledge God for the message. Point two, give God thanks for the message. And point three, meditate on that message. What is the good news? What makes it good news? And then likewise, as Peter is declaring to his audience, let's pray that we will have the wisdom to know how to share the message. Who is the audience? How are we supposed to deliver the message to them in a way that they can at least understand and grasp it to be able to respond to it as God leads them to do so? And while we're praying for all of those points, um, we're praying in the context of a day and an age where there are faithful evangelists who are going around sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And I say evangelists, there are actually people who recognize that they may not be evangelists, but because they've been trained by good evangelists, they too are sharing the message to those who are in so much in need of it. So let's celebrate the reality that the good news is being shared, that people are listening to the good news, that people are responding to the good news. And thank God, people, as we'll discover next week, um, we'll actually hear it, take it on board and do something with it. But, but that's for next week, as I said, and our next time, next episode sharing on this particular issue about the message in the bigger context of what it is to be informed. So there's five points again. Acknowledge God in the message. Thank God for the good news. Meditate ourselves on the, what the good news is. And then look for the wisdom to share the good news and celebrate the reality that the good news is being shared by kingdom people applying kingdom practices in kingdom pursuits for kingdom purposes. Thank you as ever uh, for your time on Word Search at this time with me, Christopher Dryden. On our next episode of Word Search, what we will be uh, looking at is the second part of the message 
the message that Peter gives. So look forward to further details on that second part, because we looked at the first part on this occasion. You can find out what we can learn from the second part and how that can build us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. In the meantime, I do encourage you to like, uh, share and subscribe to this channel. And remember to turn your notifications on to receive more uh, information about when the next word search session is on. Uh, as I said, you can always also check the channel for previous uh, episodes of word search to catch up on what we've shared. Also, if you are led to support the channel in any way, feel free to look on the details in the email address in the notification bar below or wherever you're accessing this message. I'll be more than happy uh, to receive that support to continue the good work to encourage people to be everything that God has called them to be. The big deal for me, though, is not just to support, but to also apply the message. You, as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, are called to be a messenger. So I hope that you can apply that at some point in your lives going forward. As ever, though, thank you for your time in listening and absorbing what's been shared in the word search with me, Christopher Dryden. I really do appreciate it. And I hope that you too will continue to find treasure in God's word and not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer for his honor and for his glory. Until next time on the word search with me, Christopher Dryden. Shalom.